Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 30. Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 30. A lot of neat things going on. This is a time frame where Jesus is working closely with his disciples. You don't have the huge crowds. He's not trying to uh, have a, a miracle ministry. He's not trying to teach multitudes. He's not feeding big groups. Uh, this is Jesus trying to work with his disciples. And they have some kinks that they need to work out in their thinking, uh, more than one. So we'll take a look at what the disciples are thinking and then see how Jesus tries to redirect their pathway in their ministry. Uh, chapter 9 and verse 30 of Mark, they left that place and they passed through Galilee and Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. Now let's just stop right there for a minute. There were times that Jesus wanted to pour himself into this small group of people. And if you read books on management and uh, on small group, uh, you really can't be effective trying to lead more than about 12 to 15 people. That's the, the size. Past that, three or four, uh, if you get three or four very close to you, and particularly one that you could just kind of pour yourself into as a mentor. So Jesus doesn't need 4,000 people in his way while he's trying to teach his disciples. And so he gets them by themselves and you know tries to hide where they are. He doesn't want everybody to know. Uh, he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. They did not understand what he meant. And they were afraid to ask about it. Uh, why do you think, after all the things that Jesus has told them, that they still were confused? They did not understand. Why did they not understand? Holy Spirit may not have allowed them to understand. It's not time for them to get it yet. That's a possible explanation. Anything else? Never happened before. It's bizarre. It's out there. It's not something that you would... Suddenly, imagine if you had a friend who was telling you, well, you know, before long they're going to get me and they're going to kill me. You'd think, well, you know, you need to see the shrink. You need to talk to somebody about this, this uh, problem that you have. And so the disciples, they know that something big is happening, but they're not really sure what it is, and they're afraid to talk to Jesus about it. They don't want to ask him what's going on. Uh, these are direct prophecies. Right? I'm going to be turned over to men. They're going to kill me. And then on the third day I will rise. That's There's nothing hidden in any of that. Uh, think about other ways that he said it. Tear down this temple and I will build it again in three days. Now you can get confused about that one. Or I won't give you any sign except the sign of the prophet Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days. You go, well, that's... That's a little odd to say something. You know, that, that's not as straightforward. They're going to turn me over to men. In other places, he's more specific. They're going to give me to the Gentiles, and they're going to kill me, and then three days after that, I'm going to rise from the dead. It's not hidden. It's not covered up. Uh, they should be able to understand it, but uh, as was suggested, perhaps the Holy Spirit, it's, it's not time for them to understand uh, verse 33, they came to Capernaum, which is home base. Uh, at least some of the family members were living in Capernaum at this point. Uh, Peter's mother-in-law uh, keeps a house there, whether it's Peter's house or his mother-in-law's house, we don't know. But they were in business around Capernaum before they went into the ministry. So this is home base. They know folks. Uh, and they went into the house. When they entered into the house, he asked them about uh, an argument that they had had along the road. Now, the house gives us an indication that whenever they were in Capernaum, they had a place that they stayed. Uh, that's one of those things that would be really amazing if they knew which one it was. Uh, archaeologists have dug up a house that they call Peter's house or the fisherman's house. The reason they call it that is that it's obvious that someone who was a fisherman had lived in that house at some point, found all kinds of things that belonged in the fishing world, but we don't know that it was Peter's house or Peter's mother-in-law's house or anything like that. Uh, so he asked them, what were you arguing about along the road? In uh, verse 34, they kept quiet because on the way 
they had argued about who was the greatest. Now tie that back to the last thing that we were talking about. They're going along the road. Jesus is explaining to them about what's going to happen to him, and they don't understand it, but they don't ask questions. Right? Here Jesus asked them a direct question. They don't want to talk about it because it was something that they know Jesus is going to disapprove. So while Jesus has them off by themselves trying to teach his disciples alone, he's got this obstacle of a group of disciples that are kind of playing politics with him. They're, they're not sure that they want to communicate openly with him about everything that's going on in their lives. Now, if you're again, if you're trying to build a team, if you're trying to build a 12-person team or a three-person unit or a one-person mentor, if they don't tell you the truth, it's tough. Uh, I had one of my interns uh, used to lie to me openly. Well, take that back. I've had more than one intern that would lie to me openly and regularly. So while I'm trying to mentor them and encourage them, they're giving me information that's just not right. And I would find out from other people, you know, that your intern is this or that or said this or that or did this or that. And I would say, well, I can't believe that. Well, believe it. It's true. And then I would confront them and eventually, maybe, possibly, would get the truth out of them. Uh, one of them was just almost entertaining. He, he was a bad, I don't want to call him a liar. He was not good at making up stories. And so his stories weren't always as believable as some of the, some of the other ones might have been. So here, here's a group of disciples. They don't want to tell Jesus what they were talking about because they know Jesus is not going to approve of what they were talking about. They were talking about who is going to be the greatest. And I know I've talked to you about this. We've talked about it several times. Who were the worst in this group about wanting to be the greatest? James and John, the brothers Zebedee. These guys, uh, they wanted to be more uh, prevalent than the rest of the group. They would ask Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, can one of us sit on your right and one of us sit on your left? Even went so far as to get their mama to come talk to Jesus about it. She was probably Jesus' aunt, Right, so it's probably Mary's sister comes and talks to Jesus. And, you know, when you come into your kingdom, do you think maybe my boys could be the top two guys and they could sit? Just human nature, family stuff, but it comes down to us through 2,000 years of Scripture and we get to read about their family stuff. But uh, James and John were that way. Uh, and Jesus addresses it by telling them what all of us have come to know. Uh, if you want to be the greatest among the group, what do you have to become? The servant of everybody. Right? You, if you want to be the greatest, you have to become the servant. So the one who wants to be the first must be the very last. He's got to be the doulos. He's got to be the one who's the slave. Uh, and so he took a little child whom he placed among them. And taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. So he takes the least powerful person uh, in the vicinity, pulls him over into his lap and says, this is the kind of person that I want you to be. Right? In another place he says, unless you become like a little child, you can't even enter the kingdom of heaven. So he loved to use children as uh, illustrations. Uh, if you're going to be the servant of everybody... You've also got to be the servant of this little child. Well, in their culture, how much clout did little children have? Okay. Think where we are and go to the polar opposite. Right. Uh, we live in a culture now that is kid-dominated. And so if you've got kids or grandkids or you work in the education or you know, if you're around kids much, you find out that they've got a lot of stuff and they've got a lot of people catering to what they want, to their whims, to their fancies. And so uh, in their culture, Paul puts it this way. He says, as long as a child is underage, as long as he's in the house, he's no better off than a servant. That's the way Paul describes it. And he says, but when the son grows up and he becomes an adult, then he can inherit, then he can be something special. He was talking about how the, the word of God in the old law compared to the word of God in the new law. Now we as Christians are now full-fledged, grown-up children uh, in the kingdom. And so he says, you know, little kids, they're no better than servants. Well, in our culture, uh, sometimes we become 
their servants. But Jesus puts the little child in the middle and says, you know, you've got to serve everybody, even people that you wouldn't think would be worthy of you being their servant. Serve everybody. All right, so verse 38. Teacher said, John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Now, this is somewhere around the same time they were having the conversation, who's the greatest in the kingdom, right? So James and John, probably uh, in the middle of that conversation, John takes it upon himself to tell somebody to stop casting out demons in Jesus' name because he's not one of us. By whose authority did John do that? By John's authority, right? So he, he wants to be somebody who has some authority, who has some clout, and he, he shuts this thing down. So I want us to take it one little piece at a time real quick. Uh, the person that is commanded not to drive out demons is not commanded to stop trying to cast out demons. Do you get the impression from the passage that John saw somebody giving it a go but not getting it done. I saw somebody or we saw someone driving out demons in your name. Sounds like they were getting a job done. Right? Uh, they were doing it in Jesus' name. They weren't part of the twelve. Right? John points that out. They're not us. So where did they get the idea that they ought to cast out demons in Jesus' name? Well, Jesus has been casting out demons, but not saying, in my name I cast you out. So it's got to be the disciples, right, who have been casting out demons in Jesus' name, or by the power of Jesus that they've been doing it. And these folks have witnessed it, saw that it worked, and taken up the habit. So here it seems to be working. We do have a passage in Acts where Paul is casting out demons, and there's a group of brothers who are trying to be uh, exorcists. And so they tell the demons, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, we cast you out. And the demon, the guy who was demon-possessed, whooped all of them. There were seven brothers. They whooped all of them and sent them away bleeding. So you'd think, well, okay, that one didn't work out really well. But at least in this case, they're casting out demons in Jesus' name, and it seems to be working. So then we get to to, uh, John's statement, they are not one of us. So who gets to decide if they're one of us? What does John mean when he says it? Not a disciple, right? Never met these guys. Don't know them. They haven't been around. They're not part of us. So they can't be casting out demons in your name because they're not part of this group. So again, remember, Jesus has taken his disciples out by themselves. He sequestered them. He didn't want anybody to know where they were because he wanted to work with this group. So John's not terribly out of line with his understanding of who us is. He wanted us to be by ourselves. You teach us. We're the 12, we're the the main ones. So he's not out of line necessarily with that in his description of who us is, but he takes on himself the authority to speak on behalf of the group and on behalf of the group leader. He doesn't go back and tell Jesus, Jesus, I saw this guy casting out demons in your name. What do you think I should do? He goes back and tells Jesus, I saw somebody casting out demons in your name, and then tells Jesus what he did. So I told him to quit. Uh, Verse 39. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can can in the next moment say anything bad about me. So here's more of a hint. No one who does a miracle in my name, were they getting the job done? Seems like it. Jesus says, you know, if if they're casting out demons in my name, they cannot in the next moment say anything bad about me. Whoever is not against us is for us. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. So the 
the you to whom they might be giving a cup of water is back to the us, right? Who John thinks is us, Jesus describes as you, right? And somebody else might do something good for you to promote you, to promote your ministry, to promote my name, to be on our side. And why would I take away their, uh, their reward for doing something good on behalf of the ministry that we're so invested in? So John's saying if they're not part of us, then we don't want them doing anything uh, like us or anything on our behalf. And Jesus says, well, even if they want to just give you a cup of water in my name, take the water, be happy for the water. Allow yourself to be served by someone who wants to do something for you in my name. Uh, so I, I went back and I, I couldn't find my copy. I think I've given it away. But there's a writer, he lives part of the time, for a long time, he spent part of his time on the West Coast. He was a, a law professor at Pepperdine. Uh, I think most recently he's been a professor at David Lipscomb in Nashville. But he also has a cottage in England, and so they go back and forth. And uh, When he's over there, he's mainly just writing, and when he's over here, he's... Uh, does work for the, the university. So he wrote a book several years ago, and the purpose of the book was to talk about the unity movement within Churches of Christ. So the question of who is us, and if they're doing something in the name of Jesus, should we be upset about it? Should we, should we not want them to continue? And he wrote a book, and in the... the uh, conclusion of the book, he, had, he includes a letter from him to Max Licato. Does everybody know who Max is? Max, a uh, very famous author himself, and uh, for a long time was one of the most popular speakers in Churches of Christ. If, if you went to a big uh, gathering somewhere, uh, lectureship, he was almost always on the, the docket. Excellent speaker, intelligent guy good writer. Uh, more and more, Max was becoming involved with and connected to groups that were not Churches of Christ. Uh, eventually, the Church of Christ where he preached in uh, San Antonio kind of changed their approach to things and lots of, lots of different things. So anyway, Lagarde writes a letter to Max uh, in, the, uh, in the post of this book. So in the book, he gives five different levels of fellowship. And I'll just give them to you quickly. I, I think that he has a, a, a good handle on it, and I would recommend the book if you, just, if you like to read. Uh, it's a good book. Uh, the first level is universal fellowship. Everybody on the planet is connected to the same genome, right? We're all human beings. We all came from Adam and Eve, uh, more recently from Noah and his sons and their wives. So we, we're all connected in the sense that we're human beings. We're all created in the image of God. So everyone has worth just based on the fact that they're human beings. And all human beings have the ability to do good things. They might not do those good things in the name of Jesus, they would do good things. So we can applaud the good things that they do even if they don't do them in the name of Jesus. Right? We agree on that? Good is good. Uh, and human beings at least have the ability. They don't always choose it, but they have the ability to do good. The second level is faith fellowship. And that is the common bond that Christians have with other Christians who share a faith and commitment to Jesus but have not been immersed into Christ as the scriptures direct. Right? So huge number of folks on the planet. There's three billion people that if you say, what religion are you, they'll tell you Christian. Right? They also are capable of doing good things. Right? Uh, most of them don't do good things and then say, I'm doing this because of Jesus. But it's possible that they say, well, I'm living this way or I'm acting this way or I'm doing this good thing because I'm a Christian. 
Uh, it's worthy of our attention. It's worthy of our acclaim that they're doing something good and that they also hold that Jesus really is Messiah or Jesus really is Christ. Uh, they're not us in the sense that they're not believers in the same way that we're believers, but they believe that Jesus is, that he's God's son, and uh, they have some kind of interaction with God through Christ. The third level is the in Christ fellowship. And that's the common bond that Christians have with all others who are recognized as Christians. In other words, if you're a baptized believer, then you're my brother in Christ, my sister in Christ. Uh, even though we may not ever meet, even though we may not have many things in common, even though there are things about our worship practices that might be different, that would be his category number three. And in that category, he includes people from other groups that are not churches of Christ, but are baptized believers in the same sense that we are baptized believers. For example, uh, people in the, in the uh, uh, independent Christian churches are baptized for the same reason that we were baptized. Uh, there are some Baptist churches that baptize for forgiveness of sins. He also wrote a book called Baptism, the Christian's Wedding Ceremony. So if you run across I think it's still in print. If you run across it, you might enjoy that. But anyway, if they do something good, can we applaud them? And especially if they say we're doing something good in the name of Jesus, can we applaud them and even be interested in them continuing to do those things? Uh, with the... Uh, hurricanes uh, recently, there were people asking, can we help through denominational groups that aren't us? Would it be okay to send a donation to Group X? Well, is Group X doing something in the name of Jesus? Yes. Is Group X helping someone where you're not? Right? You're still in your house. you still got heat and air. You're doing fine here in the panhandle. But what about those people who are doing something in the name of Jesus? Can we say that's all right? Well, some of us are kind of like John, and we look at him and we go, well, we can't support them because they're not us. Right? Lagarde says, well, baptized believers from all kinds of different groups uh, are doing something good. Maybe those things are worth applauding. Uh, the fourth level is conscience fellowship, that is close family uh, I'm more in fellowship with you than I am with the group at Area Wide because they have uh, faith issues that will not allow them to be in open fellowship with me. Right? I'm, in fact, I'm one of the problems. Uh, the idea of having a full-time paid uh, preacher on staff is one of the problems that non-institutional congregations have. Uh, Non-Sunday school. All of those things compared to we're in Christ, we're saved by the blood of Jesus, and we're all one family, fade by comparison. But some people cannot easily worship with other people, even within the body of Christ. So, uh, and it always runs to the right, by the way. Um, it's easier for someone who is farther to the left to uh, be in fellowship with someone farther to the right. So I would have zero problem being in a non-Sunday school congregation and taking communion with them and enjoying fellowship on a regular basis with them because they're to the right of me. They're more conservative than me. They would have problem fellowshipping with me because they see that I've moved away from Scripture as they understand it. Right? So it, it moves, you know, fellowship moves to the right. It's easier to fellowship to the right. But all of us want the same thing. Right? So when, when you hear that uh, someone that you know has been taught, converted, baptized by the folks at Areawide and that they're now in fellowship at Areawide, is your first thought, well, they should have come here? Or is your first thought, isn't it great that somebody's in the body of Christ? Right? The fact that, we're, that we have conscience differences does not separate us as the body of Christ. And then his fifth one is, Congregational fellowship, right? Everybody believes pretty much the same thing, although we don't really, but uh, most of us believe 
pretty much the same thing about most major issues, and it makes it easier for us to fellowship, take communion, be together, uh, support works together on a regular basis. Uh, so those are the five things that, that he draws out. And like I said, I, I would recommend if, if you like to read, you would enjoy reading uh, Lagarde. He's a good writer. Um, so whoever is not against us is for us, says Jesus. How far can you take it? Well, Lagarde takes it all the way back to Adam. If somebody's doing something good, then that's good. Uh, more to, the, to John's problem, here's somebody that's doing something in the name of Jesus. Do we want them to stop? If they're doing something good, A, we don't want them to stop. And if they're doing something good in the name of Jesus, we don't want them to stop. Right? Uh, another passage that I think is important is, who are you to judge somebody else's servant? To their own master they stand or fall. And he's able to make them stand. So wanting to be in charge of how other people live out their faith walk is above my pay grade. Uh, what my responsibility is, is to take people that are in local fellowship together and help to encourage and grow us scripturally. What they're doing over there is their faith walk and they have leadership where they are and they can do what they do. But if they're doing it in the name of Jesus, I don't feel the need to be angry with them. Uh, there's a passage in John chapter... 10, I think. And it's John again. They're going through Samaria on their way to Jerusalem. It's almost time for Jesus to be crucified. The Samaritans don't want to give them a place to stay. So they're wanting to spend the night in Samaria. And the Samaritans are saying, nope. And he's been there before. You remember when he was in Sychar and he meets the woman at the well and there were lots of people that believed in him. So it's not like there was nobody in Samaria that believed in Jesus. They just didn't want to have anything to do with him at the moment. So they come through these towns. Nobody's willing to give them a place to say, you know what John's answer was? Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy those people? And Jesus says, John, you don't know what kind of spirit you are. Right? This is, you know, within weeks of the crucifixion, he's still trying to train them. And John's like, let's just blow them up. You know, if, if, they're, if they're not us and they're not going to help us, well, let's just blow them up. And Jesus says, John, you... You do not understand. Uh, any questions about that little section before we go on?